Wonderful. So welcome everybody to Brand New to Birding Part 2. Um, here at Tucson Audubon, we always like to start out by reminding people of our mission, and that is to inspire people to enjoy and protect birds. And one of the ways we do that is through virtual events like this. Um, so we thank all of you for joining us. Um, my colleague, Luke Sapper, who is our Director of Education and Engagement, uh, will be doing the presentation today, just like he did in part one. And so with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Luke. Right on. Thank you, Danito. Good to see all of you. And um, it was fun to go birding with a few of you as well, you know, uh, paired along with these virtual talks. Uh, I like to have a couple of different opportunities to actually be out in the field and do some beginning birding field trips with you all. So there's really no substitute for being outside with other people. And that that's where I really learn the most, I think, about um, about birding and bird watching and uh, when you, you know, iron sharpens iron type of thing when you're outside and you get to experience it together. So it was really great to go birding with some of you, uh, along with this, we'll also have some, uh, special, um, opportunities for you to, uh, join me out in the field, either at Fort Lowell park or Sweetwater, uh, next week. So I have those, uh, dates and times all situated already. So when, uh, you receive the follow-up email after this talk today. Uh, you'll also get a special invite to either join me, I, I believe, Monday morning at Fort Lowell Park this coming Monday, or I think it's Tuesday afternoon at Sweetwater uh, next week. So try to, I uh, wanted to do one later in the afternoon from like 4 to 5.30 for folks who might have to work at different time or something like that. But again, you know, this is good being together virtually, and we'll discuss some uh, today. We'll discuss, uh, talk about what it's like to go to a new place and where you start looking for the birds. Like, what kind of areas do you, uh, uh, you know, when you get to a new spot, like where do you go uh, to start looking for those? And then also talking about some of the, the parts of a bird. So sometimes uh, when you're out birding with other people, they'll use weird terms that you may not be familiar with. And so we'll touch on some of those bird parts. And it's like an anatomy class. Don't worry, I, I'm not, uh, yeah, we'll have fun with it. Um, but what I'd like you to do during uh, this whole session is feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions at different times or throw something in the chat. Danito, if you see something in the chat, that's a pertinent question, feel free to interrupt me. Um, and then at the end of this class, we're going to do uh, go through an eBird photo quiz together. Because I think that if if you're not outside, you might as well get on eBird and study birds that way. It's, it's a really cool way to take a, a quiz on there. So we'll do one together. And then I'll leave you with uh, your next step. Um, so last week, our first next step was to, um, or not last week, last month, I challenge you and encourage you to find us uh your birding patch, like your local patch where you go and maybe bird it once a week and start to get to know the birds of that, of that, uh, local patch that you have. Um, was anyone able to do that? And if so, what did you learn from that? So this is a chance for you to speak into that and I'll bring up the PowerPoint while you're processing that. And maybe if I could have one or two, uh, two or three of you, um, share what you learned by birding your local patch this past month. Did anyone do that? <laughs> I, I, I did. I did. I'll just say really quickly. Oh, thank you, Anu. I, I picked Fort Lowell Park as my, as my birding spot. It's about less than 10 minutes away. And I have found that it, you're right. It does help to go to the same spot and kind of, you know, look around and get to know the birds. Um, I discovered, and I have to check my book, but I think I saw a ladder, ladderback woodpecker um, this past week at Fort Lowell. That's first, never seen that there before. So, but it, you're right. It does help to go back to the same spot and kind of get used to the, the noises and the rhythms. Yeah, most definitely. That's a great way of putting it. Because then when you go to a new spot, you recognize new noises. It, you may even recognize some of the noises from the other spot. So it, it just kind of, it helps sharpen you a little bit. 
Thank you for that. And cool siding with the ladder back woodpecker. Someone else. Um, yeah. I use my backyard mostly, Ginny, and um, I would find that certain species were a lot more gregarious for the feed than others. Like the white crowned sparrows would push all the other birds away. <laughs> and the Abers tohi would do the same thing. So that's that a, kind of fun to see that, the hierarchy. Great observation of birds that are more gregarious or like getting together in um, flocks as opposed to those that don't, you don't really see in flocks. So that, that can be a good way of helping with identification too. So that's a really good, cool thing that you noticed. Anyone else before I move on? Uh, Luke, this is Nancy in London. Can you hear me? Oh, I got you, Nancy. Okay. You? I always have to check that 6,000 miles doesn't mess us up. Um, you may know that I have the largest communal garden in London. It's a quarter of a mile to walk around it, contained, uh, contained by six-story tall buildings. And what I found is that the more I go, the more I know where certain birds live so that I can, I can catch them diving in and out of certain bushes, a goldfinch. And then we have whole herds of seagulls which come in and nest in the middle of the garden well nest they walk around the middle of the garden and have found out that they're extremely shy and extremely difficult to identify so i haven't managed to get any of those yet yeah goals are notoriously hard to identify um specific thing like look at leg color look at the bill um the, those are the two first thing and, and color of the eye can help sometimes too so like bill, eye, and legs. Those are the things to start to look at with those with those goals. But yeah, I I'm glad that you're uh, you're seeing all that, Nancy. That's that's a, that's a way to learn for sure. All right, so let's dig in here. And uh, so we we covered a little bit about what we're learning, what we're seeing with our patch. This is a a picture from Sweetwater Wetlands, which is, of course, my patch. And um, learning those birds at Sweetwater definitely helps me when I go to new places. So uh, let's talk through this a little bit. When you uh, go to a, a new uh, location that you've never been to before, like how do you go about um, starting to, to bird that area? So uh, sometimes that can be a little intimidating, like, all right, which trail do I take or what direction do I go? Those sorts of things. Um, it may seem kind of elementary a little bit, but really it's, it's something we, we all kind of, uh, maybe struggle is not the right way of saying it, but we all kind of have to process when we, when we arrive somewhere, when it comes from, from a, a birding mindset. So like if you're going to Patagonia Lake and your whole, um, reason for going there is to go swimming, you go, where do you go? You go straight to the swimming the, the swimming area. If you go there to go boating, you go to the boat launch. So if you go there to bir go birding, like how, how do you go about approaching that? So let's, here's, uh, here's Anu's spot. This is Fort Lowell Park. Uh, I like to use Fort Lowell Park for, for thinking through all this because it's, um, it's, it's a lot, a lot like other parks that we have in urban Tucson and really across the nation. So uh, it's, a uh, it has uh, different ball fields. It has big open areas. It has a pond. It it's a little bit unique because it also has like this big uh, pecan orchard over here on the right. It's neighbored by a bunch of uh, houses. And so, how do you go about? Um, wh where do you where do you go first? H how do you go about birding this location? If uh, we went there actually yeah let's do this so if, if you go there so one of the main things whether it's fort Lowell or anywhere else the first thing i always do is look for the edges so for some reason uh birds and wildlife uh they love like the edges of different habitats so whether it's um like if you're birding a forest and instead of walking through the middle it, and there's a clear cut and then there's mature forest, instead of walking through the middle of the mature forest or walking through the middle of the clear cut, 
the best way to approach something is to walk the edge of the clear cut. Um, so it's the same thing. Like if you go to, um, uh, let, let's say like, uh, Madera Canyon. So if you park at Proctor road and you have, um, you, know, you, you have the edge of the riparian habitat where it meets kind of the more grassland habitat instead of walking down just the middle of the grassland or the riparian, walking along the edge is always the best spot. And that holds true for urban parks too. So uh, the picture here on the right is Sweetwater Wetlands. It's the eastern most part of the wetlands where there's a there's like a service road. And then along the service road, you have um, a whole bunch of hackberry, mesquite, palo verde. And so walking along that edge of that uh, park, that that's where you get the majority of your uh, white crown sparrows and Abert stohees and thanopeplas like they're out in the open, but they also have the habitat to hide inside. And that's the same thing with the photo on the left. This is at Fort Lowell Park. This is right along the edge of the, um, I believe, the northern part of the park where there's like some neighbor, like some kind of scattered neighborhoods on the north side and there's a fence line that goes down. But this is right along the edge here. This is where you're going to get the um, different sparrows and different ruby crown kinglets and gnat catchers, and warblers. They'll love this edge a lot more than walking out in the open of the park. So when you get to a location, always looking for habitat edges, fences, fence lines, where there's um, some sort of uh, demarcation line. Um, because that, that's going to give you the best bed of where the majority of the birds, the best variety of birds will be. So always looking for those edges. And that's something that goes through my mind all the time. So, of course, another thing to process is where is the water at this location? You know, if you go to Reed Park, probably along with uh, edges uh, uh, along where there are some more mature trees, next to um, park areas, you're going along with those areas, the first place you're going to go is probably one of the ponds. So if you go to Sweetwater, you know, having the right where the water is at, that's where the birds are going to be coming in. Fort Lowell Park, if we go back to that picture, there's a big pond right here. Normally, for most people, that's that's the first location that people go to. And, and um, it, I, I would say that 95% of the time when I go for a low park and I start birding that location, I'm going to start by going to that pond first. But so e there are those really noticeable areas of water, but there's also the areas of water that maybe we don't really think about. So if you recognize that there's um, like some sort of water spigot or something somewhere else out in the park, um, even if it's small, that's going to be a place that you want to go check out. And then um, it's one interesting thing at Fort Lowell Park where those pecan orchards are at. So anywhere there's like agriculture or orchards or anything like that, there's going to be some sort of watering system that they have. Try to identify what that is and see if it um, is something that would attract birds. So here at Fort Lowell Park, what's really interesting is the way they water their pecan trees is they have irrigation that creates these kind of uh, just um, areas of water that just sit around the pecan tree. So you can see it here in this picture where there's water around this pecan tree. And once you understand their system of watering that, you'll know that in this orchard, all these birds come and flock at the bottoms of these pecan trees uh, to get their their morning drink or whatever it may be. Also, any not only do the birds use the water to to drink, but also it's usually a source for bugs too. So it's a, a food source for uh, vermilion flycatchers, a food source for black phoebes. That's why you always find black phoebes around water um, because that's where the food is at for them. So identifying those water spots is really important. So the other, th talking about food, the other thing you want to do is identify 
plants that you see that are have seed pods or fruit or some other sort of food source for the birds. And once you can identify what um, the orange crown warblers and yellow rump warblers are eating, then you could go and kind of look around the rest of the park for those specific plants and identify where you should spend the most of your time looking. So for instance, right now, uh, a lot of the um, desert broom, which is what's here on the left, you can see the desert broom with these kind of whitish flowers here. Uh, right now, a lot of our desert broom is blooming and has these seeds. E either It's either the seeds or there's some sort of insect that's in those seeds that orange crown warblers and ruby crown kinglets love right now. So anywhere that you can find desert broom that's flowering like this, you want to spend some time in that area to look around. On the right is a, a berry plant uh, from down at Peña Blanca Lake. Uh, so uh, this wasn't this year, but last year uh, in the winter, I birded Peña Blanca Lake. And anywhere that I saw these bushes is where I was seeing the birds. And so I just started instead of... Um, you know, spending so much time looking for movement, I was still doing that. I mean, that's one of the main things you want to do when you're out looking for birds is, is movement or, or hearing them. But along with that is identifying where the plants are at, um, or what kind of areas terrain for those plants are normally at and going to those locations and looking for birds in those locations specifically. So, um, if you have trouble trying to find the birds, or if you want to attract birds to your yard, make sure that, you know, this also gives you an idea of, Hey, I'm seeing all these birds coming to this de desert broom. Maybe I should plant some desert broom in my backyard. Maybe that's something that would be really helpful. So looking for, for those plants is, is a, is a good step to when you're thinking about how you go and bird a new area. So one other thing I do that main, um, this is actually one of my favorite things to do. When I go to a location, identify the high places. So, um, you know, high places are interesting, both from a humanity level, but then also from a wildlife level. So, uh, for some reason, humans love high places, you know, where we can kind of look down is why we love, uh, a mountain so much and places like that, but also our wildlife really does too, uh, especially raptors. So uh, if you're a raptor, a, a raptor person, like I think most of us are, if we love looking at kestrels or red tail hawks or trying to find, you know, the next Merlin or prairie falcon um, or even flycatchers, flycatchers love to perch up there too. But thinking through all the different places where birds can perch up high and look down. Uh, so um, identifying those places. So whether it's power poles, uh, snags, uh, buildings, fence lines. So like, here's an example from Sweetwater. There's a big tower out there. And every time I go by this tower, I look to see if there's anything up there. So another example is the pond over Fort Lowell Park. And so these different snags that come up out of the cottonwoods, scanning both with my naked eye first. And then if anything looks kind of out of place, looking with my binoculars as well uh, at each of these different snags. So uh, whether it's their high up snags or whether like ones that are really prominent or maybe some of these lower ones that could be blocked by some leaves. Uh, and also the like the little posts that are out here in the water. So looking at all of the snags, looking at all the fence lines, looking at all the buildings for uh, perched birds. Um, so looking, even looking off in the distance at, you know, power poles, um, one of the ways that at Sweetwater, um, that I build up a list at Sweetwater is I get over on the far West edge, uh, along where the, uh, Santa Cruz river is at. And on the West edge, you can look out over a lot of Western Tucson and see power poles way out there you can see um power lines you can see uh different snags and so from that vantage point of the western most part of sweetwater 
you know, with my naked eye, I may not be able to see out on some of those areas, but I'll take my binoculars and I'll scan each of the power poles to see if there's something interesting that's sitting up there or the big towers. You know, if you've ever been out there with me, we always look at the big towers to see where the red tail hawks are at. And so, you know, if you want to add those raptors to your hotspot list, looking way out there. So even when you're at Fort Lowell Park, you can look off to the west across Craycroft and look at some of those power poles to see if there's a Harris Hawk that's perched up there. Um, so um, making sure that you cover all those different areas gives you the best chance to see the most variety of bird species. And it's interesting, like there's a lot of bird species that love to perch up high making it easy for us to find them, but sometimes it's on man-made things that we don't really think about looking at. Uh, cause, um, sometimes we just have a mindset of looking in the, the foliage, you know, or looking deep within, um, the brush or something like that. Let's make it easy on ourselves. Right. And just look at some of those, um, places that are out in the open, maybe they aren't close by, but that's why we have optics and look out, uh, for those raptors there. So the fifth thing that I do, uh, there's probably a lot of other things too, but the, the last one uh, to touch on here, um, when I'm going to a new spot, I think through the habitat and try to think through what is the habitat telling me about this location, about what birds I'm going to see, uh, what birds might be possible, where I should start walking, whether something is worth walking through or not. So like when I'm at Fort Lowell Park and I'm looking out over just a, an open field like this, I there's there's not a whole lot that's going to be out there in that field. Maybe maybe some metal arcs, maybe some blackbirds out there. Sometimes they'll feed out there in the grasses. Sometimes there's some others, but you can just like uh, take your binoculars and just scan through it real quick. Like you can cut down on the area that you walk through because this type of habitat isn't going to produce a whole lot. Um, but what else would you do if you're looking at this, if this is your view at Fort Lowell Park and you're thinking about birds and birding, what is something else you would do besides telling yourself, uh, this big grass field, there's probably not a lot that's going to be out utilizing this habitat. What else would you do if this is your view? Someone chime in. I'd look for the fences, the edges. Yes. Yeah. So like there, even like the, um, it's kind of hard to see. So like there's a, a ball field here and there's like the dugouts and everything, even looking at the tops of the dugouts. Cause that's where like vermilion flycatchers and say Phoebe's, they love to hang out just on the, the, um, the backstop of the, of the baseball field. I'm sorry, I'm cheating because I that's what I've actually seen. So <laughs> Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. See, it's it's true. And and you recognize that because that's your that's your patch. Uh also looking up on the light, the light poles, you know, uh thinking through like what could be up on the light poles besides rock pigeons? Maybe um brown headed cowbirds or blackbirds love to congregate up there on those light poles, maybe a peregrine falcon. So checking out each one of them, um, is, is important. Do you guys have any, any other thoughts or questions when it comes to coming, like visiting a new location and what goes through your mind, any questions on that or thoughts? I'm wondering how you decide where to go when you visit a city and how do you use eBird to like figure out where is a good hotspot? Great question. Great question. Let's go to eBird and look at that real quick. How's that? So let's say, um, let's just throw out a city. How about Albuquerque? Anyone been to Albuquerque lately? I've, I haven't been there. I've actually never been to Albuquerque. So that's a, that's a good one to pick. I don't know why that came to my mind. Uh, maybe it's a Bugs Bunny thing. I don't know. Doesn't he say that? Like which way to Albuquerque or something? All right. So let's go to, I would go to um, explore regions. So from eBird, you go to this button, explore. And then this is the page you come to when you hit explore. 
And if I type in Albuquerque, actually that the city probably wouldn't come up. So I'll go to New Mexico. And then New Mexico comes up. Actually, you know what? I don't I don't like that way. There's too many different ways to be able to do this. Let's do an easier way. Let's go to explore hotspots. So we click on explore hotspots. This gives you the whole map of the world and all the different hotspots ever in eBird. And then you just um, scroll in to New Mexico and Albuquerque. Here it is right here. And so when you come into Albuquerque and you see all these hotspots, the first thing that goes through my mind is the blue, the blue balloons are the least variety of bird species at those spots. As they go from blue to green to yellow to orange to red, the red is the um, highest variety of bird species. So if I'm going to, to Albuquerque, the first thing I recognize is, oh, the river comes right up on the west side of the city. So that's probably where the the most hot spots will be, the best locations. And it proves out true because that's where there's more color, more variety. And so I always like to go to um, the hot spot that has the reddest color. So then I would just click on this little red balloon right here. And it says, this is the Rio Grande Nature Center State Park. And so I'm going to click on this hot spot right here. And then what it's going to do is it's going to bring up a lot of different things. One of them, the first that we see here is uh, recent sightings. These are from December 12th. This is from this morning. And so you can go to this page and you can just click on the most recent sighting if you want. Click on that. And you can see how long they were there, how far they walked, and then the whole list of the birds that they saw while they were there. And that will give you an idea of you know, what's around. Um, so you can look at it that way. Uh, and then if we go back to that hotspot, then also what we can do is we can click on up here on the top right, map. And so that map will take us to back to where we were at. And so you, you can um, scroll in deeper to kind of see the map and a little bit of an overview of what it looks like. You can see that there's a couple other hotspots that are next to it. This one to the left is the visitor center. That's probably a good idea of, hey, this is kind of where I'm going to start. This is where I'm going to probably find a parking lot. And you can click on that one and do the same thing. So let's click on that and you'll see a whole nother list of bird sightings. You can scroll down a little further and you can see all the different recent visits. And um, the other thing you might utilize when you're going to a new spot is the directions. So from here, you can click on directions. It'll give you the coordinates. You, from here, you can get directions from like, hey, I'm going to be staying at the Embassy Suites near the airport. How long is it going to take me to get here? And you can just hit directions. Oh, not my location. Let's do uh, Albuquerque International. Let's go to the airport. So then you just put that in there, figure out how far it is from where you're at. And let's go back to uh, go back to the, to the hot spot. Uh but then if you uh, want to go somewhere that's closer to you, like, hey, I'm going to be staying at this hotel. Uh, there's a there's maybe a, a hot spot right next to where I'm at. And let's click. Maybe I want to go to Fairview Memorial Park. So you then you just click on that. Oh, there's a cemetery. Probably don't want to go there. You could. It's like 120 bird species seen at the Fairview Cemetery. And then again the same thing you just click on that to take you to that so when i go to um when i'm traveling and i'm staying at a hotel i kind of see like what's around me in the area that i'm free to travel to 
and then just kind of think from there, look at those different lists to give me an idea of, of what to, what to see, what's around. And then I'll utilize this to the Google maps to just kind of scroll in and be like, all right, if I'm going to go to Fairview cemetery, uh, what's the parking situation look like? Oh, there's a apartments to the South. Looks like there might be some parking up here on the North and then, um, you know, kind of take it from there. Luke, uh, just to, to hop in real quick, um, Peggy yeah. made a good point in the chat, you know, especially when you're traveling to new cities, um, when you look at the checklist, you may see birds that you're unfamiliar with from your area. You can also just click right on the bird. And so that'll give you an idea of what to look for, um, you know, before you get out there in the field. Yeah, for sure. There's, uh, I mean, this is the the wormhole that you can go through, which is eBird, which um, there's so much inf information. So like if you um, are going to Albuquerque and you're from the Tucson area, you're probably not familiar with downy woodpecker. Uh, we're familiar with ladderback woodpecker. We're familiar with Gila woodpecker, but a downy woodpecker. Oh, I've never seen that before. So you can just click right on the name of downy woodpecker and see this nice little small woodpecker that has this, you know, white kind of big white line coming down the back, a really, really small bill. It's a small, small woodpecker. And then you can go down and see different pictures of it. You can listen to the audio, uh, that you can, yeah, so much, so much information here. Any other questions there, Danito, or anyone else? Nope, that's all we've got all right. right now. Good stuff. All right. Well, let's do this. Let's talk about uh, a little bit of bird anatomy, shall we? Doesn't that sound fun? Oh, look at all these arrows. Oh, man. A lot's going to be coming here. Too many arrows, Danito? What do you think? It's all right. All right. Yeah, that's good. That's good. <laughs> so some of some of these parts are um, easier to understand than others. All right. So we're just going to start off with some easy ones. But so if you've ever gone birding with someone who maybe knows more, you know, put in quotes, more about birds than than you do, um, it can be really intimidating to have someone talk about primaries or uh, lores or napes and you're like oh, what the heck is a nape and i just want to tell you uh, that i still feel this way this is not my forte all right my forte is not bird anatomy it's not the uh i'm much more of a, a relational birder than a scientific birder but just, let's just get into some of these and um feel free to ask what other parts are and Maybe I can know what they are or not. But let's start with some easier ones. We got like three different pictures that we're going to look at to kind of think through some of this stuff. So <laughs> let's start easy. All right. So there's like three different spots here on this bird that you'll hear birders talk about a lot. Like, hey, it's got a uh, the difference between a uh, a northern prula and an orange crown warbler. One has a yellow throat. One has a white throat. That's that's not true, by the way, but that is just for the sake of talking about it. You will you will hear birders talk about uh it's got um a breast band or it's got um uh, a white belly. So just for the sake of being able to know all that and to be able to, to grasp something pretty easily, we can we can get throat, breast, and belly. So we got all three of those, I think. I think we could pass the test there. Now let's get to some other ones. So some birds will have a, a broken eye ring, and some of them will have a complete eye ring. Some of them will have an eye line. A northern prula has eye arcs. So eye arcs, uh, you see it's, it's a, a white mark above the eye and a white mark below the eye. It's not so much a broken eye ring, but it's eye arcs. And so anytime that, you know, you're looking for different birds or, you know, especially smaller birds like warblers, uh, sparrows, kinglets, vireos, 
you're going to hear things like it has spectacles. So like spec, I should have a, a picture of like a Columbia Sphero, which has like white all through here. And it's like big white spectacles. Actually, let's, let's just do this so I can, let's, let, let me show you what a spectacle is. Columbia's, um, oh, come on, there's too many Columbia's birds, Columbia's Vireo. So you can see the white. We're going to find out pretty soon what this section between the bill and the eye is, what this is called. But this white extends all the way from the bill and then all the way over the eye like an eye ring. This is called a spectacle. And then you have eye arcs. And then let's go back and look at ruby crown kinglet, which is an eye ring. Here's the eye ring. Uh, so that eh, doesn't really look like a complete eye ring on that one, but it does have a complete eye ring. Uh, <laughs> let's look at a better example. Yeah, kind of. But anyways, so you're going to hear that a lot, all the different parts, uh, ways that the white goes around the eye is really important. So that part that was white for the the spectacle of the plumbus vireo, the part between the bill and the eye, those are called the lowers. Uh, I don't know how it got that name, but when you hear of something, whether it has black lowers or gray lowers, so um, one example is white crown sparrow. Let's go. Let, let's look at white crown sparrow here. Because there is a sub subspecies of white crowned sparrow that they they have different colors of lores. Let's look at this. So here, this one, you can even see. Ha! Oh, this is perfect. Adult dark lord white crowned sparrow. You see how this black extends from in between the eye and the bill. That's called dark lord, and so that's what it means. Um, not that it's a mysterious, evil, dark lord, but it's the lores between the, the bill and the eye. That's a, that's a dumb joke, but that just came to me. So let's look at a gambles. Now, this is, you would think that instead of gambles, maybe they would call it light lord instead of dark lord. But look at this picture is... There's gray in between the bill and the eye. The black from the crown doesn't go down into that lower region. So this is a great example. This section right here that's gray on this bird is the lower is gray. And then if you go back to this one, it's black. So you're going to hear that a little bit in the birding world is what is a lore. And that's, that's what it is there. So one interesting thing on this Northern Perula, one way to uh, identify it, there's a lot of, it, Northern Perula is one of those uh, warblers that has a lot of different um, characteristics about it that separate it from other birds. But one is uh, this yellow lower mandible. So the upper, there, you can see on the bill, there's an upper bill and a lower bill. So instead of upper and lower bill, it's called upper and lower mandible. So on some birds, you want to look at what color is the mandible. And on the prula, that is one of them. So that's that's another uh, piece of anatomy that you might hear quite a bit. But one of my favorites is the nape. And the nape is basically the back of the neck. So when I'm talking with other people, uh, Usually I'll say, look for the gray on the back of the neck. Like that's not really like, I'm not, I, I, I try not to use real technical terms a lot when I'm birding with people, especially birders who, um, are just getting into it. So like, don't feel like you have to use nape unless you want to really impress someone. But if you want someone to understand you, you can just say back of the neck, um, that's basically what it is. It's so, um, some, you know, once a species of bird that this is important is like a clay colored sparrow or a chipping sparrow. So let's look at those. 
let's look at um, clay colored sparrow. So when people are trying to uh, decide whether something is clay colored or chippings, one thing they'll talk about is the color of the back of the nape. And you can see here, the back of the nape on a clay colored sparrow is, is all gray. And so uh, it's gray all the way through the back of the neck, the whole nape. Um, let's see if we, you can see it really well here too. You can see it there. So let's look at, um, let's look at chipping sparrow. Okay, so it's gray, but then there's also, you can see a little bit of a line that goes down through here. It's pretty faint. Let's see if we can get a better backside view of it. You can kind of see how it's kind of dark there. They don't really show it too well. But there's a part of it that's not all the way gray. Maybe we can see it on Brewer Sparrow. Yeah, you can see how it's a little bit darker there on the back. So Brewer Sparrow, Chipping Sparrow, Clay Colored Sparrow, they're all part of this called uh, Spazella Sparrows. And so, but that's one of the things to look for is the color of the back of the nape. And um, so that's true with a few other birds as too. All right. So below the nape, this little part right here, that's green. On the prula, this is this is why one reason why I picked the prula here. But this green, that area of the back is called the mantle. Now, uh, Nancy was talking about uh, all the goals that she has there at her place in London. And I talked about eye color, talked about the bill, you know, whether uh, uh, to look at the bill, if it has any like red spot on it or not, or like leg color, whether it's pink or yellow. But the other thing to look at on goals, just like here on the Prula, is the mantle. So the back, um, and whether you know it has a dark mantle or a light mantle, like what color is the back? So it's just another fancy way of saying back, really. Um, but you know, scientists they want to have like uh, those real names for it. So mantle is the back of the bird. Um. This one, this next one, let's see, which one's coming up next? Ooh, yes, here's a good one. So, undertail coverts. So, uh, uh, quite a few birds, whether it's, um, like, think of um, Abert's towhee, think of Canyon towhee, think of um, Kerbill thrasher, uh, maybe gray catbird. Uh, they have, a lot of them have like some rusty color underneath of the tail. Uh, and underneath the tail, those are called the undertail coverts. So it's also a really good mark to distinguish orange crown warbler from Tennessee warbler. Let's look at that. Let's look at that. Let's go to orange crown warbler. Oh yeah, this is great. Let's um Okay, let's see. So this is a pretty bright orange crown warbler, but you can see the undertail coverts are all yellow right here. Let's look at some yellow. You can even see on this really gray colored one, it's yellow under these undertail coverts. Now let's look at Tennessee. Boom, white. Look at this. So these under, see, it's all white right there. It's got some yellow on the back, yellow on the top. Oh, you, sorry, yellow on the mantle and yellow on the, the wings there and on the tail. But then white underneath of the tail. So you could say just underneath of the tail and people will understand you, but you could say undertail coverts and sound really smart. And, uh, you can look, even see on this one, it's like almost all yellow, but then when you get underneath the coverts right here, so not necessarily the, like the butt of the bird, because the butt of the bird here is yellow, but it's under the tail. These are the covert 
feathers and they're white. You go, you can even see the white a little bit on this one, even though you just see the back, you can see how the white goes underneath there. Oh, they all show the back. Come on, show those coverts. Here's another one where you can see a little bit of the white undertail coverts. So like, uh, What's interesting, like at Sweetwater Wetlands right now, there's been some reports still of Tennessee Warbler. And so you have all these orange crowns. And the first thing that you look at on, the first thing I try to find, look at every time I see an orange crown warbler is what's underneath that tail. Um, so that's something to be thinking through as you look at, uh, as you look at birds. And that's what they're called, undertail coverts. One more on this Prula here. And, uh, it's a, it's an easy one, just wing bars. Um, we'll, at the next, uh, slide, we'll talk about the actual wing a little bit, but for the sake of just wing bars and whether a bird has wing bars or not, if you hear of someone talking about that, those are these two spots right here are where you're going to want to look for, for the wing bars. Let's look at this next one and then we'll see if there's any, any questions regarding all of this. All right. So here is um, some of my favorite birds, ducks in flight. Ah, I love it. I could watch these cinnamon teal all day. Um, beautiful shot that Tom caught here of these of these teal. But it gives us some a, a look at the wings as well. So um, here's some different things I, I look for in the body in body part language for for these wings. So this first part right here. The, so you have undertail coverts. These are the, the wing coverts or the shoulder. And so um, when you talk about like um, blue wing teal or cinnamon teal, they both have these blue wing coverts. And so that's a part of the duck that you really want to look at in flight, along with the other part here that's, I think, really important. Oh, maybe not so much this one. So these are the primaries. This whole section that's kind of black on this cinnamon teal from here, you can kind of see where the, where the different feathers start. So uh, this whole triangle right here that kind of looks like a shell almost, these are the primaries, the feathers that stick out the furthest on the bird. And so the other part that I really look at when I'm identifying birds in flight is this inner part that's green on a cinnamon teal and those are called the secondaries um, we can get into a lot more talk about tertiaries and all that but let's just focus on the wing coverts like the shoulder the primaries which is that part of the wing that extends furthest out and then the secondaries which is this kind of uh, part of the wing that's that's in and a lot of times it's also called the speculum. So uh, on ducks, when they're um, swimming, like if you see a green wing teal and you see a little bit, a little bit of the, of the green on the wing when it's swimming, that's called the speculum. So that's part of the secondaries and it changes on different colors. So or, or on, it changes color for different duck species. Um, so just for example, let's look at, let's look at green wing teal. You'll be able to see. Uh, it's not really showing so much on that guy, but you can see it just barely right there. This is a little green speculum right there on this female green wing teal. Sometimes it's noticeable. Sometimes it's not. You can see the green right here on this green wing teal. Uh, anyone know what color it is on the gadwall? Danito, you got any guesses? Uh, what, the come on the second gadwall, the speculum on a gadwall. What color is that? Oh, no, I don't. Uh, yes, blue. Wrong. Uh, oh, right. but hey, I had a question. That... Uh, Karen, actually, real quick. Um, so when the wing is closed, are you only seeing the primaries? When the wing is closed, so like on this gadwall right here, yeah, these right here would be the primaries. The ones that stick out. Okay. And then sometimes you'll see the secondaries. Like if the speculum is showing, then you're seeing the secondaries of the bird. So like um, you can see that the um, 
the wing coverts on a gadwall part of it is gray and then it has this rusty color and then the secondaries are black and white and so it has this black and white um speculum patch so here on this bird this whole section right here the outer part that's the primaries and then the inner secondaries I have a here. question. Yeah. Um, are primaries and secondaries, is that terminology used like when we're looking at a hawk as well? Like all birds? Yep. Yeah, okay. definitely. Let's go to red tail hawk. Oh, there. Okay. So on this picture, there are um, a myriad of different anatomy parts that we could go over on this specific red tail hawk right here. And I thought about putting it in here, but it would, it would go through a lot. So like patagium and all this different stuff that, don't, but the secondaries, uh, you know, again, this outer part or primaries, the outer, outer part, like where the, the tips of the wings are coming out. And then the secondaries inside, um, some day we will just go over red tail hawks because, with the raptors, there's so many different parts to look at, like what this little dark spot is here, the this shoulder patch right here, the patagium, uh, the different parts of the tail. It just gets really specific. But in general, whether it's a red tail hawk or whether it's a green wing teal or glaucus wing goal, it's like a glaucus wing goal. Oh, there's got to be a, a flying pitcher. Yeah, again, primaries, primaries here, and then secondaries on the inside. That's a good look at it there. So secondaries and then primaries. So like uh, you could say, you know, a um, lot, I, I don't use the, that language a whole lot, but you will hear it from folks. So it's just good. It's good to know. So on the inside, again, primaries on the inside this cinnamon teal that's down here at the bottom primaries down below and then the secondaries right up there on the inside and then the other wing coverts oh whoa what happened what do you mean uh everything just went dark on me on my computer my computer screen oh we can still see that there we can yeah. still see the cinnamon teal i got like a it just oh. My whole screen just like did like a trying to did figure lose, out what's did you lose on. power? No, I well, was weird because I could still hear you, and um, but my screen is totally black, and I'm trying to hit escape, trying to. Uh, now dude. I just see everybody's square. Yeah, let me. Um, I don't know what happened. I apologize for this. Um, Maybe just share it again. No, I, yeah. I can't. My I can't even see um, my mouse or screen or anything. So I don't know what's going on. Well, um, while we're while we're waiting, maybe on you should get out quick. and come back. Yeah, yeah I'm gonna have to, I might have to shut down my computer here real quick. Here real quick. Okay, I um, apologize yeah. for that. I'm gonna yeah. I'll be right back. Okay, well, uh, I'll vamp. <laughs> um, but So some of you may see in the chat, um, Jesse just put a, a link to a really good website, um, birdsoftheworld.org. Um, and like uh, like she said in the in the chat, it's got a lot of info on birds and their feathers and things like that. Ooh. So that's always a, a fun site to just kind of spend some time on. And then Nancy, I didn't forget. I didn't, I didn't miss your question about the, the Tennessee warbler. So hopefully uh, Luke can get everything ironed out. And then I was going to ask him to go back and, and go back over the, the Tennessee warbler's eye markings. I think Luke had said covert and then underwing covert. Um, right. So, like under t the yeah the undertail yeah under t the t the wing coverts and then the undertail coverts. Ah, okay, I got it. Um, 
Yeah, all about birds is all about birds.org is also a great, great website as well. Is there a difference between chin and throat or they're the same area? Between which one? Um, chin and throat. Okay, I think I'm back. All right. And that was the weirdest thing. It looks like all of a sudden, like I had this line go down my computer and it just went totally black. I have no idea what happened. All right, but I'm back. Let me uh, share my screen here. All right. Well, so real quick. So Anna Marie, so I think they're kind of interchangeable, but I mean, I would think, you know, just using our anatomy as well, that the chin would probably be a little bit higher Ooh. up um, is where the throat would be a little bit further down. Um, but I, I'm pretty sure, especially when you're talking about more common terms like that, sometimes they can be used interchangeably. Okay. Woo. Thank you. Another good bird to look at, um, I, actually, I think Luke's back on, but the black-throated gray warbler um, has yellow lures, that area right in front of the eye. So that's that's a lot of times a real good bird to look at to give you a really good idea of what exactly the lures are. All right, Luke, are you back? Yeah, I think Adam can All hear right. me. Yeah, we can hear you. All right, I'll pull up that black throat of gray too so you can see it because that, that's that's a good example. So are you seeing black throat of gray right now? Are we all on track? Man, I apologize yeah. for that. That's so weird. Yeah, we, we got you. Okay, yeah. So you can see like the little yellow that's in between the, the bill and the eye. That's a little yellow lore on the black throat of gray. There's another good example of it. Crazy. I still don't know what happened. That was so weird. All right. And and then also, Lou, just want to let you know, before we move on from kind of the body parts, um, Nancy was hoping that you could go back to the Tennessee warbler and just kind of go through the eye markings again. But just just before we get off the body parts. So whenever you feel a, a good opportunity. No, we can do that right now. So the the eye parts for Tennessee warbler. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Yeah, so um so the Tennessee warbler uh, a a lot like orange crown warbler on the on the face for the eye, it has an eye line with an eyebrow. And what's actually interesting is that that's exactly I was going to go through the parts of the face next. So that that works out pretty good. Hey, let me put my uh my video on. All right, there we go. So let's go to um Let's, let's look at some of the parts of the face. So here's a song sparrow. And we'll run through a few of these. So one of the first things to look at, especially in sparrows, is like the color of the cheeks or the auriculars. So that's kind of like, uh, you know, has the uh, auricular, it has to do with like the ear area. So, uh, you know, so the auriculars and cheeks are in this area just, behind the eye and so for uh like i said especially sparrows that's an area that you're going to be looking at often and maybe a word uh a part of the anatomy that you'll hear from other other birders so that's where that's at and then just like on that tennessee warbler which had a, a little bit of an eye line so that's here's the eye line sometimes you hear eye stripe whether it goes all the way through uh, into the lowers. Fix you an omelet. Oh, I would love an omelet. Here, you want to put that oh. on? <laughs> I'd love an omelet. My wife makes omelets all the time in the morning. She never asked me, so thank you for asking. Um, so eye line or eye stripe is one of those different areas of the bird face that you're. Uh, it's it's a part of. The face that a lot of times when we look at a bird, we're going to look at the face first. And so it really stands out, whether it's uh, fly catchers or warblers, looking for those eye lines and eye stripes will be important. Above it is the eyebrow. And a fancy way of saying the eyebrow is supercilium. Danita, have you ever used the word supercilium in your life? Only normally on field trips to point out to people that I don't normally use words like supercilium, but that's, <laughs> a, that's about it. <laughs> I, I'm an eyebrow person rather than a supercilium, but that's, that's what it is. So like some of us, you know, we're going to be in, uh, 
in different areas where like that will be used. And so just knowing what that is, it's an important part of the bird face is the eyebrow. So, and then we have the crown. You hear, we have all sorts of different birds that have uh, crown names to them. And so that's um, the area that you're going to be looking at. Oh, look, it's that important that I put it on there twice. I don't know why I put it on there twice. Supercilium or eyebrow, it's on there twice. That's how important it is. And again, the lores, that area between the eye and the bill. So here's an interesting uh, part of a bird that you may not have thought that you'd ever really look at. But this line that's in between the upper and the lower mandible is called the Coleman. Really, the main bird that you want to look at the Coleman on, uh, house finches or Casson's finch. So check this out. This is really interesting. Let's go to back to eBird. And let's look at uh, house finch. Very common bird that we have. So check this out. On this house finch, look at this, the line between the upper and the lower mandible. It's called the Coleman. And see how it curves? See how it curves down like that? If we go to the next one. <clears throat> Again, it curves. Now let's go and look at a species that sometimes it gets confused for and can be more of a uh, irregular visitor down here to the lowlands of Tucson. But if you're going to be looking for Casson's finch, one thing to look for is whether the Coleman is curved like on the house finch or whether it's straight. See how it's a little bit straighter? Let's look at another one here. See how it's got a, a straight Coleman? Let's look at another one. Straight. So on a house finch, that line between the upper and lower mandible is curved. It's called a curved Coleman. And then on Casson's finches and purple finches, which is another one that can get confused with house finch. That's more rare around here, but purple finch will have a straight Coleman as well, I believe. Yeah, see how straight that is? When on a house finch, it's going to be curved. So that's that part of the bird. Very interesting. You can you can get um, really impress your friends with knowing what a Coleman is. Here's an important part of the bird, whether it's a sparrow or whether it's something like a prairie falcon. But this section uh, sometimes will, uh, it's called a malar or like a malar stripe. So below the eye, the throat is right here. So it's on the side of the throat underneath of the eye and it's called a malar or malar stripe. It's like prairie falcon. Let's look at that. Prairie falcon. We'll have a nice malar stripe. Look at that. Boom. Isn't that beautiful? This part right here is called the malar. And whether, again, like whether it's a sparrow or whether it's a, a raptor, it's going to be an important part of the identification process. It's actually a word that I do use when I'm talking. I don't know what else to call that. It's not the throat. It's not the side of the face. It's malar stripe. Let's see. Another bird that has a malar stripe would be... Um, Let's look at uh, maybe whoop, Rufus Wing Sparrow. Whoop, whoop. Does it have? Oh, yeah. See, look at that. Kind of um, some throat or malar striping on there, too. So, uh, Something like this, you know, whether you know it's a throat or male art, at least you can kind of say that whole kind of area when you're trying to describe a bird to someone. So this is an important thing too, like when you're, if you're doing an eber list and like you see something that might be a little rare and you're trying to describe it, being able to use words like this, not that it's going to impress any eBird reviewer, but at least it gives you something to work with a little bit when trying to describe where on the body you saw the yellow or where on the body you saw this white stripe, whether it's an eyebrow or an eye line, being able to distinguish that using some of that, that verbiage is, is good. So it's anywhere under the eye there, it, whether it's going up and down or sideways, it's just the placement of it. Yeah. Uh, when you're talking about Malar, is that the question? Yeah. 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 yeah a lot of times it, 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 it 
you can see just like on this, along with that prairie falcon, it's kind of like a downward uh, stripe. That's the malar, malar stripe. So it's always handy to have like a Sibley bird guide or something like that. Uh, they'll point out some of those different parts. And at the beginning of the book, it has all these different, um, like, uh, like a bird anatomy section. If it's a good bird book, it'll have that. And Sibley guide will have that like different parts. Uh, it'll have a bird and it'll have all these arrows, just like what I had here, but even more so like in depth with like what, uh, different parts of the face are called on a bird. And so just, um, not that you have to study that or anything, but looking at it every once in a while, especially like when you're trying to describe a bird that can be really helpful. Any, any other questions on like the bird anatomy stuff we're running probably because of my, uh, my little snafu there. Um, I don't think we're going to be able to, we'll, we'll look briefly at a eBird photo thing. We won't be able to work through the whole thing, but, um, any questions there? Are the Cassins finches in Tucson? Not so higher elevation. So like around Rose Canyon Lake, that's the best spot to, to find them. Cause they, they're kind of tied to like conifer trees. Um, and then every once in a while they'll come down into lower elevation, but, but not, not very often. Uh, let's see, actually, let's go to, uh, I'll show you it real quick. Species maps, going to species maps is a good way of, of looking at their distribution. So if you go to species map and type in Cassin's Finch, you can see this is the area of the world that they live in, kind of Western United States. And as you scroll into Tucson, sinking. You can see the majority of the sightings are from up here in the, in the mountains or kind of on the edges. And very rarely is it found down here in the valley. And it doesn't look like it, if there's recent sightings, they'd be in red. And so it's an eruptive bird. So some years there's a lot of them. Some years there's none. And it looks like this year there's, there's none that are being seen in this area. Kind of interesting. I think it was last year, like we had uh, quite a few sightings. So, hey Luke, um, just got a quick question from the chat. Um, and I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name, but I'm going to say Angel um, ask if there's a field guide that discusses what habitats the bird prefers. Um, and before you answer, I mean, I'll give my favorite. Um, actually, I have it right here by my desk. I kind of keep it. Um, it's the Crossley ID guide. Um, Basically, you can see each bird picture has a habitat behind it. So to me, this is my favorite book that talks about bird habitats. Um, Luke may have one of his own. Again, mine's called the Crossley um, ID Guide of Western Birds. Luke, do you happen to have a favorite that really talks about habitat? I think the cool thing about the Crossley Guide is that it actually pictures the bird within the habitat in different ways that you might find it in the habitat. So whether it's perched up in something or whether it's kind of hidden in the reeds, uh, it gives you that sort of sense of where you would see it and how you would see it. Uh, another good book when it comes to that, that's more local is, um, the, I think, I think it's called birds of Southeast Arizona or birds of Arizona by, uh, uh Richard Taylor. And it has um, some stuff in there about habitat, but then also like what elevation you might see the bird. So like if you're looking at Cassin's Finch in uh, uh, Richard's Birds of Southeast Arizona book, it would tell you that uh, it's seen with usually 5,500 to 8,500 foot elevation or something like that. And then it would tell you like Kerrville Thrasher, you know, from... Uh, you know, lower elevation, it would give like a range of, because so much of our birding here in Southeast Arizona is tied to elevation. So like lower elevation, Gila woodpeckers, you go up just a couple thousand feet and then you're going to get, um, uh, you're going to get Arizona woodpecker 
And then you go up another couple thousand feet, you're going to get Harry Woodpecker. So um, that book by Richard Taylor is really good when it comes to local birds like that. All right, let's let's dig into um, really briefly. I'm going to go to back to eBird. And if you go to the eBird homepage and then go to explore. So this, this has to do with your homework for the next month before we get together uh, for our last session at the end of January. The, I want you to do like two or three of these. Go to the explore section of eBird. From this explore section, you're going to scroll down to the bottom right and it says photo and sound quiz. Danito, could we put a link of this into the follow-up email for favor? All right. So you from can... this, what you're going to find is that you could, um, oh, I've done six photo quizzes in my lifetime. And so you're going to start a quiz, just hit this big green button. And you can, uh, the last one I did was for Jalisco, Mexico. I'm going to be going there in January and I have no idea what, what I'm going to see down there. But let's not do Jalisco. Let's do uh, let's do Tucson. Tucson, come up. No, nope. let's go Pima County, Pima, Arizona, and birds in the region. And um, I'm gonna go to year round. You can even choose for like what time of the year. So, like if you're gonna go to Albuquerque and you want to know what's there, you could just choose Albuquerque. I'm gonna be there in March. You could choose March 10th. And it would just pull up these different birds that are seen there uh, from that time from the eBird database from photos and um, all possible birds from the location. I don't want to do sound. I want to do photos. So let's pick photos. And then you just hit start quiz. It's going to create your quiz and it's going to be like 20 questions. It's going to show you a picture of a bird and then it's going to give you like four choices and a none of the above choice. So, hey, here's a great bird to start off with. So lately at Sweetwater Wetlands, we've been seeing these really cool shorebirds. And um, so it'll show you the picture of the bird. And then it'll say, what bird is this? Short-billed dowager, red phalarope, long-billed dowager, or Wilson's phalarope? And so... Uh, oh boy, we could spend all day looking at the, look at the crown on that, the crown stripe. Look, it's got an eyebrow. It's got yellow legs. Uh, yeah. So you just have to, it, it, it's a, don't worry about getting it wrong type of thing. You can use your bird book. Like it's an open book test. Like don't, don't stress about like, oh man, I have no idea, but take the time to look in your bird book and some of the pictures are better than others as well. So mm -hmm. like, um, I'll just say this is a, these are Wilson's snipe. So we're going to do none of the above. We're going to click on none of the above. And look, Wilson snipe. It gives you a little checkbox there. Um, and then you, before you move on to the next question, you have to rate the image. So this is kind of fun too. Um, yeah, whether five stars, like the best picture, one star is the worst. I'm going to actually choose. I don't really like this picture. I'm going to do two. Okay. And then, so it goes through all these different birds and you can kind of go through this, this test. Um, so I want to challenge you to take one or two of these before January. Uh, tell me how it, tell all of us how it went. Um, when we reconvene again in late January, but it's a really good way to kind of, um, test your knowledge, help you to find birds in your bird book, uh, think through the different parts of the bird. Um, and then you get to rate some, some photos from people too. That's kind of a, a side benefit of it. Um, let's see, let's go back to any questions on that, on the photo quiz. All right. So become a better birder, take a photo quiz. And so here's your, uh, here's your assignments, two assignments. 
uh, between now and the end of January, along with possibly doing a bird walk with me next week. But take a photo quiz, one or two of those, and then visit a new location and think about how, uh, when you go there, think about going to it from a birding perspective and where you're going to start walking, how you're going to, um, yeah, start looking for birds in that spot. So again, thank you for hanging in with me when I had that computer issue. I'm not really sure how that happened or what happened, but i um, glad I was able to get back on with y'all. Any last thoughts before we close up shop? So I'm having problems getting to where the quiz in, is, and I think I need to, um, I think you said that there was a tutorial on the website or somewhere that you recommended about eBird. Yeah, I don't think you need to have an actual eBird account to uh, take it, but you may. So to do that, um, let me see here. To do that, yeah, just go to start with eBird.org and there should be like an about section and then there's a help section here too. Um, it, so I would go to either of those or it might say to create an account or something like that. It's all free. It's, um, you know, all, a, it's a really legit um, database. And then you just go to explore and then go to photo and sound quiz and you should be able, it, it should work. If, if it doesn't work, uh, touch base with me or Danito and we can help you out as later on. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. And, sure. And uh, also just to jump in on that and I'll include a, a link in the wrap up email, but um, you were referencing the eBird about how to find um, back in August, we actually had a two part um, eBird virtual uh, event um, and both of those are on our YouTube channel. Like I said, everything we do is always going to be in our YouTube channel, but I'll include a link to those presentations in today's wrap up email. All right. Well, thank you guys. And uh, so in the follow up email will be the links for the eBird tutorials, the photo quiz, and then um, the two different field trips that we have coming up next week, one at Fort Lowell and one at Sweetwater. So thank you guys again and go out birding soon together and happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Yeah, See thank you later. You. Thanks. Thanks everyone.